Uh, well, thank you very much. Thank, thank you for inviting me to, uh, to this important um, event. And let me say, I echo everything that Yvonne has said, and um, I shall be amplifying one or two of the, uh, the aspects that she's mentioned. So I'm going to mostly be talking about work that um, we did in Cambridge when I was responsible for all the staff in the university a few years ago. Okay, <clears throat> so um, familiar story in Cambridge around 50% of our postdocs are female, we have 4000 postdocs altogether, but only 20, a few more, a bit, bit more than 20% of our full professors are female. We have too few women becoming academics and too few being promoted, but the pattern is different in the sciences and the arts and humanities and we might talk about that later. Um, women are generally more reluctant to put themselves forward for new roles, promotion, pay rises, fellowships and grants. Uh, and then to add to that problem, committees tend to make appointments in their own image, as, as uh, Yvonne said. And this is a particularly acute problem in Cambridge because we have a very low turnover rate. Once people are appointed to the positions in Cambridge, they tend not to leave. Uh, to leave. And why does it matter? Well, it wastes 50% of our talent. Uh, and as uh, we heard earlier, more diverse boards, more diverse workforces are more effective. So there are, there are two aspects to the problem. And one is around policy and the other is around culture, workplace culture. Now, over the last decade, policies have made a lot of progress. We have equalities legislation, we have training for awareness. We try to make gender balanced appointments, fair workload models in theory, but often not in practice. And in Britain, 10 years ago, uh, the National Institute of Health Research, which funds all our big clinical research projects, insisted on a, a Athena Swan Silver Award for grant renewals. And at the time, Cambridge had a £114 million grant, which was it, it was in danger of losing. And that did rather concentrate the mind of the vice chancellor and I was able to extract from him major resources for Athena Swan activities which were encouraging uh, better uh, gender outcomes. So we have a lot of good policies in place but the problem is culture and how do we turn policy into successful outcomes. And uh, the kind of responses we would get in Cambridge when we started working on this 10, 15 years ago, well, well we're the best already, we're the best, why do we change now? Or um, if I start talking about the long work hours culture, then I have said, well, but it's an international competition, you know, in America and Japan, they don't have, they don't care how long it, we work. Uh, I had, of course, men saying, well, it's a woman's problem, not mine. And a few successful women, especially if they've become successful by behaving like men, have said, well, I'm successful, nobody helped me, why should we change anything? So there are a variety of cultural problems that we need to think about and to tackle. Now, an early initiative we had in Cambridge was called YSETI, Women into Science, Engineering and Technology. And um, it was initially focused on undergraduates, but uh, when I was involved, we, the first thing that we did was to introduce mentoring of CVs uh, for women who were seeking promotion by um, neutral volunteer academics from elsewhere in the university. So not their head of department or their, or their um, manager, but we, we helped, we looked at people's CVs, we helped them to improve them we identified gaps and uh, initially this was just for women, but it was very successful. And now that's a facility that's available to everybody who wants to apply for promotion, uh, male and female. But the more we thought about it, the more we realized that actually there's an important principle here. And that is there's a lot of research which shows that women and also BME staff, black and minority ethnic staff, tend to be more adversely affected than white men are by poor culture or by poor management and governance. If we accept that that's true, 
then it will also be true that women and BMR, BME staff will tend to be more favourably affected than white men will by improving the culture, the management and the governance. Uh, so the conclusion from that is that in general, initiatives and schemes should be devised that are open to everybody, even if we expect and hope that women will be the main beneficiaries. Um, if you devise schemes that are exclusively for women, it does generate resistance in some areas of your male colleagues. Um, so one area where we've worked hard is around the, the processes and criteria for academic promotions. We increase the weighting, the proportion of, of teaching and administrative contributions to the overall case so that research becomes less dominant. We reduce the barrier for part-time applicants. I think this is very important that uh, many of our colleagues have not been working full-time in the last five years, sometimes for family reasons, sometimes for health reasons. And we've now adjusted the criteria so that someone who's been working less than 100% has to present work of the same quality, but the amount of quantity that we expect for them to be promoted is adjusted. So if they only worked half time in the last five years, we only expect half as many papers or half as much grant income, half as much teaching contribution. That makes a very big difference. We encourage everyone to declare their caring responsibilities We've, we've reduced the weighting of things like international travel. This, of course, is pre-COVID. Um, if you make international travel a criterion for promotion, you will inevitably disadvantage women. Uh, so that has to be removed. Um, we invited all the eligible staff to workshops to explain what was happening, what was changing. And we have made heads of department responsible for interviewing all eligible staff and to encourage the reticent to imply, and they're often, not always, but they're often women, and discourage the premature applications, and usually that's enthusiastic young men who want to get promoted very quickly. And we also make those heads of department explain to any unsuccessful candidates why they were unsuccessful. We're trying to encourage an honest discussion between the management and those who are applying. And in the last few years, We've now got the same proportion of eligible women applying as men, which did not used to be the case, and with the same success rate or some or in some areas of the university, a higher success rate. We created a scheme called the Recurrent Carer Scheme, which provides funds to assist staff in catalyzing and building up their research profiles after they've had a period away from work for um, family responsibilities. And uh, we put together a fund of £300,000 a year. We make small grants and these have benefited hundreds of families and careers, mostly female, but not exclusively. And many of them are postdocs. The most popular kind of grant is that when someone wants to go to an international conference after they've have been away for parental leave, we will pay for a, a carer for their ch child or children to accompany them to the conference. So they can go to the conference and take a young child or children with them um, and they can combine their family and their work life. And the person who goes with to look after the children may be their partner, it may be a parent, it may be a professional carer, we don't care. That has made a huge difference to people to get them back into visibility, back into networking and community. Um, if they don't want to travel, we'll bring collaborators to Cambridge. We've, we've, there's a variety of scheme, very, it's very flexible. An interesting benefit of this is, of course, it's a very popular scheme. The head of department's got to write a letter of support and unexpected benefit is the head of department has now got to think much more than he, and it's usually he, um, has had to in the past about work and family interactions. 
And so in retrospect, and this was not intentional, but it's a, it's a benefit. This is, this is a policy which supports and validates employees' decisions to combine work and family life. And it's also beginning to raise cultural awareness and sensitivity among some managers who've not thought about it as much as they should have done. Uh, we've got some other things. I mean, we have a fixed retirement age here in Cambridge, which is unusual. And what that means is that people like me who are retiring are mostly male uh, and a fewer, uh, but the new appointees are more likely to be female than those of us who've retired. That's making a, a difference, but it's very slow. We've got much stronger instruction and training for appointments committees. We have equal parental rights, uh, parental leave rights for women and for men. Um, with a very generous financial scheme to make it easy, getting men to take up the leave is still a cultural challenge. Uh, we published a book which celebrates different kinds of success of women in Cambridge. And we asked all, all women in Cambridge, you know, who do you admire amongst your peers? Uh, we eventually celebrated 26 in this book, which you can see on the web. It's a wonderful book. And it demonstrates, it celebrates many different kinds of success, administrators, secretaries, um, as well as some famous professors. There's still a lot that we need to do around workplace culture. Um, chairing meetings, this is something that is not thought about sufficiently, but the way that a meeting is chaired is really crucial ensuring that all members have an opportunity to speak uh, and ensuring that all constructive contributions are properly acknowledged um, training your chairs to make sure that they are that they behave well is really important part-time working uh, is really important it's important to recognize that all work we all work part-time none of us work 24 7 and there's an arbitrary definition of what is full time. And I think it's vital to recognize the value to your institution, to your families, individuals, and indeed to society, the value of part-time work, uh, which enables people to work and to look after their family and to make contributions to society. Uh, and for your promotions processes, your assessment processes, to take proper account of that. And this is very rare in most universities. And I would say to anyone who has to leave a meeting early to go and collect their children, don't, you know, traditionally men pretend they've got another meeting to go to rather than saying, I've got to go and pick up the children. You know, it's really important to say, I'm going to go and look after my children now. Um, and there's, we have in particularly in Cambridge, we have a very long hours culture, which is, uh, I'm afraid, quite difficult, quite toxic, and we still haven't improved enough. Advice and mentoring, this is something that Yvonne mentioned. Informal, what we call old boy mentoring, reinforces the tendency for men to network, you know, after work and so on. And it reinforces the tendency for men to apply for promotion too soon, while women tend to apply too late. So we've put in place quite a lot of formal mentoring processes um, honest and well-informed advice are crucial and I don't believe it's essential for women to be mentored by women or men by men. Um, I think if you speak to a lot of successful women they'll tell you that support from men was really important. And we need to encourage nominations for prizes and other recognition that's got to be fair and equitable as well. That tends to be done too much by the old boy network. Now, when there are administrative and caring roles, nurturing roles in your departments, senior leaders tend to turn to women first and ask, and women are more likely to say yes than men. Um, so if a head of department asks a young man to do something that's not research, he's likely to say no, and women are more likely to say yes. I would say that leaders, heads of department, need to be more even handed in their search when they're handing out these roles and women need to be stronger in saying no I've got to do my research or I've got to do something else ask a man I, I, I recognize that's not always easy um, 
so my final slide is, I mean, changing culture is what we really need to do. And it all actually all begins at home. Parental need needs to be shared equally. Child care and other domestic responsibilities need to be shared properly. Uh, and universities, employers need to, to recognize and account for that. And so if you change, start to change the culture, the next generation will grow up in a different sort of attitude. And so I'm just gonna end on a personal note. Uh, when our children were small, my wife went back to work. She was a lab technician. She worked long hours, no flexibility in when she could leave the lab. So I frequently had primary childcare responsibility. I did all the, I still do all the cooking. Um, I took the children to violin lessons and piano lessons, all of those sorts of things. And then after we all had a meal in the evening, I went back to the lab to be with my research group and I wrote a textbook um, and I did a variety of things. And my message, my final message really to um, people of the next generation is, uh, but also to senior leaders is I had a very family oriented lifestyle when I was young and it did not mean sacrificing my career. Um, and I think it is possible, it must be possible for us, at least in a university system where we have lots of advantages of flexibility in the way we work, um, for us to be able to achieve a successful family life and a successful career. And I'm gonna stop there. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sanders. Uh, many interesting uh, points uh, coming from Cambridge. Thank you very much. Um, so just a question for me regarding the, um, uh, the research they have brought, because so, um, a year ago I did a podcast with, uh, with uh, five uh, female researchers here, four professors, one assistant professor, and they all mentioned that, you know, the research day after the postdoc was an issue to most women, beca women because at that point in their 30s, they had uh, very often um, a partner in the midst of a career as well, and, uh, and maybe kids as well. So, so do you think that we should reconsider where the research day abroad after the postdoc is, is crucial for, uh, for your promotion? Should we, should we review um, uh, you know, the, the research day. Um, in my ideal world, we would, um, and I think now what's happening is people are spending longer and longer as students, longer and longer as postdocs. So they get their first academic position, probably 10 years older than when I started. Um, I started my academic career, independent academic career, when I was 24. That's impossible now, I think. Um, personally, I would take a risk on giving more people tenure younger. You know, if you give 10 people tenure and only seven of them turn out to be really successful, then that's a pretty good success rate. And however you define success, and I'm not going to I'm not going to go down there right now. Um, if you give people more security early on in their career, then they will feel more able to um, have a flourishing family life, knowing that they've got some security. At the moment, we have the worst of all worlds where people come for tenure in their mid thirties, which is the worst possible time really mm -hmm. uh, for a woman who wants to do both. And so you, you, you speak about part-time, uh and parental leave and part-time work is not really an option today in the, in um, in academia, and that is something that sort of uh, uh, it's it makes academia very different from from uh, from the rest of of the world. Um, and I guess there's a culture difference there. We need a culture change if part-time uh, should be an option because. Very often we have focus on, you know, progression and speed. You have to publish all the time in order to get promoted. Uh, should we review these uh, these criteria as well? I so I come back to my point. We all work part time. You know, what's the definition of nobody works twenty four seven? We all work part time. Um, I think it is possible for people to work, say, 30 hours a week rather than 60 hours a week or 70 hours a week or 80, which is what we often see in Cambridge, um, 
it's possible for people to work a smaller number of hours, particularly at crucial points in their, in, in their family development, and for a promotions process to take account of that. If you know that somebody took a year away from, for whatever reason, for whatever good reason, they took a year away in the last five, then you only expect 80% of, their pro of the productivity. And you can account for that quantitatively. There are many universities that in their promotion say, we take account of circumstances, but actually there's no evidence that they do.